Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Savvy Cast. This is Jamie, and I'm so grateful to all of you who are joining today, whether you're listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube. Today, I have a very special guest. It is a friend with whom I was recently reunited after more than two decades. And I'm so thrilled that she's here. She's going to share some very, very interesting and intriguing information. I would like to welcome my old friend, my dear friend, Suzanne Terry Cunningham to the Savvy Cast. Suzanne, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And yes, you and I um, saw each other again a couple of weeks ago after uh, honestly, I hate to say it, but I think it's been over three decades instead of two. Decades. Oh, you're right. Wait, Suzanne, I graduated in 84. You're two yes. years old. Oh, gracious. Yeah, yes. I'm, we're I right mean, at We're getting on up there in age, sad to say, but it was so <laughs> great to connect with you again. Well, I knew this day was coming because just to um, everyone who's in on the conversation, Suzanne and I went to high school together and we were cheerleaders together. Yep. And if you're watching, you can see she's T90. She was always T90. She was always as cute and adorable as she still is. And <laughs> I knew that Suzanne and I were going to eventually meet because her beautiful daughter, Reagan, is engaged to be married to one of my very best friend's sons, JR, and we just had a shower for JR's sister, and Suzanne was there. Mary Catherine went and got me and brought me, said, look who's here, and I almost died because it's been so long, but <laughs> Suzanne, I'm so thrilled, and everyone, what's, um, I'm going to start by asking Suzanne, the typical icebreaker, what would you choose as your last meal? Oh my goodness. What a question. This is so funny because um, my family, this Memorial Day weekend, we ended the, the Memorial Day by going out to our favorite Mexican restaurant um, at our lake. And so we got to talking about this very question and we were going around the table asking what our last meal would be. And so I could only narrow down mine to probably my favorite three things, which are mm -hmm. all bad for you, but taste so delicious. Um, one being pizza mm -hmm. of any description, not picky. The other would be beef nachos mm. um, because I have to throw Mexican in there somehow. My all-time favorite, if I could only pick one, might have to be a Jack's gravy and biscuit. You are kidding. Huh? <laughs> I am not joking. I could eat my weight in those. And I can remember when I was in high school on Saturday mornings, my sweet daddy would go, you know, we didn't have a Hardee's. I That's think we right. eventually got a Hardee's at some point, but there for a while it was only Jack's. That's right. And, uh, I mean, no, right. The opposite. We, so, we, had a, we had a Hardee's, but not a Jack's. That's right. We had a Hardee's and a Sonic. Hardee's and Sonic. Yes. Right yes. across the street from one another. And so uh -huh. my sweet dad would go to Hardee's and get me a gravy and biscuit every Saturday morning while I was growing up. And so I don't know if it's that I love the taste of it so much as much mm -hmm. as it is just the nostalgia of it. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of my childhood days, but that would probably be the number one favorite last meal, closely followed by pizza and beef nachos. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, you are still in the North Alabama where um, close to where we grew up. And I cannot believe that on your list, because it's one of the things I'm out is Big Bob Gibson's barbecue. Oh, yes. You know, yes. We, and Suzanne, you don't have to experience this because you're, you still have access to it. There's no uh -huh. barbecue down in Birmingham or, or beyond that I've had that uh -huh. tops Bob Gibson's and yes. you can still dabble in that. And let me throw it's this amazing. in as well before we get into what we're really going to talk about. You and your husband own one of my favorite restaurants in Muscle Shoals. Is that right? Oh. We have one in Muscle Shoals and one in Florence. Oh, you have two. Uh, Tzatziki's. You own two Tzatziki's. And that is one of my favorites all the time. So that's I really interesting. I love Tzatziki's, yes, because um, I feel like I'm not cheating on my diet. Not that oh. I'm really on a diet, but I, I, I do try to eat healthy, mm -hmm. you know, as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's just so easy to eat healthy there. It seems like it no is. matter what you pick on the menu, it's 
it's very healthy. It's, yep. it's usually lean chicken, lean pork, all the choices that I like anyway. Yeah. Good for you. So I don't feel so guilty when I, I slip myself there. And yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, if anyone watching or listening, if you've never eaten at Tzatziki's, find one near you. It's fabulous. And I actually had the original owner of Tzatziki's and he's still involved, but Keith Richards did a podcast with him and it's intriguing to see where he started as a, um, he was, he worked the bar at Highlands Bar and Grill and waited wow. tables. And then now there's over 90 Tzatziki's and he has just wow. built, built it all. It's amazing. But, but that what I wanted Suzanne to share with you all today is an art that I have always admired. I've always wanted to be good at. I'm not, but Suzanne is not only a master of this art. She teaches hundreds of people regularly online how to do this. And it is the art of calligraphy, the most beautiful handwritten art there, that there is. And Suzanne, I was so intrigued as we stood at the shower and then another one of my dear friends was standing there and she heard that you taught others and you taught online. It didn't matter where you live. She says, oh my goodness, my niece would love to do that. There are so many people who would love to learn. I would love to learn. And the fact that you have created a course where you are able to teach people and they are in their own homes and they have access to you. And then they end up with this wonderful creative skill and talent that they can then take to whoever knows where to make, have an extra job or just to gift people with beautiful art. So Suzanne, let's, first of all, would you define calligraphy? Because I think everyone knows it when they see it, but what's the definition? Right, right. Well, so calligraphy really is a kind of script that you do with either, I'm going to hold this up. I know you can't see it up close, but this is the pen that I use. What is sticking into this little metal holder right here is called a nib. This is a pointed nib. So calligraphy is done with either a pointed nib or a broad edge nib. I solely do the pointed nib. Mm -hmm. A broad edge nib has a flat edge, sort of like a chiseled marker. Mm -hmm. So it makes those big, huge, wide, broad strokes, hence the name broad edge scrib script. Mm -hmm. um, I do only pointed pen, but calligraphy is really different kinds of scripts, different kinds of styles of scripts done with either the broad edge or the pointed pen. And so it dates back hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, so the style that I prefer and have sort of always been drawn to is called copper plate calligraphy. And way back in the day, hundreds of years ago, um, the old engraving masters would engrave these copper plates and then they would make, uh, it, they would have the plate of it and then they could print from that. And so since they were engraved on copper plates, the name copper plate sort of took over um, English round hand is what it originated as mm -hmm. or in grocer script. But since they were engraved on a copper plate, then the name copper plate calligraphy sort of was a little bit more popular. Okay, Suzanne, that was hundreds of years ago were this may be a dumb question but were books written in calligraphy back in the day yes everything was written well books that you just read for pleasure may not have been written in calligraphy but uh -huh. all of the documents you see any kind of certificate written um receipts from when you would go buy your grocery items those receipts oh. sometimes would be written in calligraphy so people so like calligraphy yes it's my job i, I do it all day now but back hundreds of years ago they sat and wrote things for a living, this is how they paid their bills. This is how they provided for their family. And there were hundreds of these people everywhere that did this as their job. Um, wow. And in every document, every um, legal in a courtroom, I guess they had to transcribe the Bible. 
Was Everything is done in calligraphy. I'm not sure about the Bible. I'm sure there are some versions of Bible, the Bible in calligraphy. Um, well, so maybe in the temple before the Bible, maybe back in the, when they had the scrolls and the scribe, the yes. scribes and the Pharisees. Yes. So the scribe, doesn't that, that really mean? is where it began. Yes. Oh, yes, for wow. sure. So it's been around forever and ever and ever. And so how has it evolved, Suzanne? Like how back in the day, it was essential and it was the livelihood of many. So compare that to today. Yes. What, how yes. would you compare? I, I feel like today it it is still a business for a lot of people. And that that is how they pay their bills and provide for their family. But for a lot of people, it's just a great hobby that might be a little side hustle, might be, um, you know, something that you enjoy making birthday cards for your friends or, you know, a sympathy card, or you might make a little commissioned poem for your good friend that just had a baby. Things mm -hmm. of that nature is what I feel like a lot of people do calligraphy for these days. It's not that they're going to sit and write all day long, every day, but mm -hmm. it is such an interesting hobby that they can make money at if they want to, mm -hmm. or if they just love the therapeutic um, feel that they get when they see that ink coming out of the paper. And I mean, at, onto the paper and they like to fill their time up writing for fun. I feel like it's a little more leisurely now than it was in mm -hmm. the 1800s mm -hmm. um, where it was their, their way of providing for their family back then. Mm -hmm. Well, Suzanne, can you tell us how you got started? What interested you enough to get you to where now you're teaching? And let me just say, can you hold up just maybe one something that you've done? And I'm sorry to my podcast listeners, yeah. but I will say I've seen beautiful calligraphy before. I have never seen anything like never. Well, oh my goodness. you're wow. very sweet. And I don't know about that, but this is just, um, this is a wedding invitation that I did. And, you know, mm. there are a thousand different things that you can have calligraphy on, whether it's a poem, a Bible verse, a housewarming gift, um, note cards. It, I mean, the, the choices are truly endless. That you a can wall, calligraphy on. the wall, the wall. Absolutely. I, yes. I'd like, yes. I've, I had a, a, friend years ago who calligraphied a a bible verse on a it was on sheet rock it was on like a ledge that when yeah. you walked in and people had to walk under that right. verse and it was beautiful I eventually had to paint over it because the house and wall needed painting but yeah. Yeah. you are right it's it's almost like a, a beautiful antique something fine and yes yeah, yes and to be treasured no doubt because there is so much time and energy poured into even just this one little invitation right here hours and hours of work went into just this and that is after years upon years of training um a so lot it took people, you hours to do that one oh yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, that look, when I look at that, it's absolutely perfect. And and the spacing, do you have, I mean, everything is, it's, well, it's a piece of art. It is, it is a piece of art. And the one thing that is so great about doing the wedding invitations or any kind of long piece that has to be reproduced, what you do, first of all, is write this in pencil on a large sheet of paper, not this size. It's impossible to write, not impossible, but it's very difficult to write this small and mm -hmm. make it look perfect. The smaller you get, the harder it gets. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you sketch it out on pencil, just like on computer paper. Mm -hmm. And then you place that on a light pad and go over it in pen really large Sometimes I write the whole thing. Sometimes I just write it in little sections. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm sort of struggling, not having a great writing day, I'll just write maybe three or four lines at a time. And then this whole thing has to be digitized because if you try to reproduce it straight from the original copy, every little bump and shake and bobble everything shows up a thousand times over. So it's digitized. So it can either be blown up or shrunk and it's not going to be pixelated. And so all of that is done digitally. You can center everything digitally. And so if you write this in little chunks of text, you can piece it all together digitally. 
So that's when I say so many hours and oh. blood, sweat, and tears have gone into just this one little thing. So it's not like you have to take this size sheet of paper oh, and write it one time and run copies. It's, oh. it's just much more, I guess, comprehensive than that. So um, it's, it's like you're putting a puzzle together. Oh, totally. Totally. Oh my it's, goodness. I never, I think honestly, surely everyone out there pretty much thinks like I did that you get those pieces of paper. You would think so. You, wow. yes, you now, would. when you yes. digitize Suzanne, is there a special machine or is that just a printer? How, how do you digitize it? That well, for starters, I'm going to give you a very first grade answer because I don't do the digitizing myself because mm -hmm. like we talked about before, I can email and scan and shop like a trained professional. And that is <laughs> the extent of my computer knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I have a source that does that for me, but it's done in Photoshop and Illustrator. Oh. So it's just a computer program that my dear friend who lives in Mississippi taught himself how to do, which is very annoying. Um, by watching YouTube videos and he is very tech savvy and it just clicked with him. So he digitizes everything for me. And one great thing about him is that he's a calligrapher himself. And so he knows exactly what the letters are supposed to look like. And he can look at my letters and he can go, oh, well, that that B that she made has a little bobble in it right here. I'm going to smooth that out. Oh. Or, you know, like this letter is way too round that she made he can make it a little bit more narrow little things like that that if just a regular person who weren't a calligrapher but knew how to digitize mm -hmm. things they may not know what the letters should look like so they wouldn't catch near as many things as the the guy that I get to help me um, and you don't have to be you you can work remotely with him because he's not oh, in okay totally. yes yes so all I do once I get the the inked copy and I'm happy with it I just scan it at a very high resolution mm -hmm. and send it to him and he works his magic and he'll email me back the file and um I, I've always said I really need to learn how to do this it'll save myself some money because he charges me rightly so mm -hmm. to do it but then I thought you know if I'm not writing that's what I do best is right. write. I'm right. not computer savvy I wish I was but I I just am not so mm -hmm. I am best doing what I can do the best at and so I just outsource that and let him mm -hmm. do what he can do best, which is all of the digital work. And mm -hmm. so that gives me more time to be able to write. Yes. So and to teach. Both of us. Yes. Now, now yes. I want, because you shared this, um, some of this with me at the shower and I found it intriguing. Um, tell everyone how you had this little, this love inside yes. of you for yes. this but it, it, it came slowly, but explain that. Yes, yes. So I have always loved and appreciated beautiful letters and beautiful writing. E even as a child, I would sit and fill up notebooks trying to copy letters out of the Speedball textbook, which speed is ball. Speedball. Mm -hmm. This is the oldest um, resource book for calligraphy of all different kinds, pointed pen, broad edge, all different kinds. This is the 19th edition. And so they come out with a new edition every, you know, two or three years. And this is the ed edition that my mom had. She was a great artist. And uh, so she had not this very copy. This is a not the, her copy. I feel like it's still at her house, which I need to find. Mm -hmm. um, but this is another copy. But this is the page right here that held my interest the most. That's beautiful. Is, is that the one that is that uh, the copper? This is the copper plate style calligraphy. Oh. And I would sit even with a ballpoint pen or a pencil and I would try to copy these letters and replicate them. And what I didn't realize is that I was really teaching myself how to make the proper letter forms because I didn't have a calligraphy pen. And so I was actually drawing these letters, not writing them. Like I was drawing the shades in and then going back and coloring them in. 
So it really made me learn where the shades were, where the hairlines were, you know, at what angle each of the letters sat. And so I really was learning the proper letter form and I didn't even realize it. And how old were you when you started doing this? Oh gosh, maybe 10 years old. Oh I don't my remember, goodness. But I was, I was a little girl. I was it for sure in elementary or middle school. And so I, I've always had the appreciation of the art. And then in 1993, I was living in Birmingham. Um, my boyfriend, who's now my husband at the time, he lived in Birmingham also. And he said, you need to, to, to make some samples of your work and let's take them around to some wedding stores, some bridal stores, mm -hmm. and just see if you get any business. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And there was this great stationery shop in, in Homewood. It was called weddings, et cetera. It's not there anymore, I remember. Mm -hmm. um, but it was on the curve in Homewood mm -hmm. and Sally Hobson was the owner and she was so very sweet to me. And she had this big book that had all of her calligraphers in it. And if you ordered your wedding invitations from her and you needed a calligrapher, you could look through her book and choose one. And so for whatever reason, we clicked. She loved me and I loved her. And so she was so sweet and kind to recommend me to brides back in the day before social media. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if I did say an order of 300 envelopes, that was 300 people that saw my work. So that was really my calling card. Wow. There, was, there were no you know, ads in the newspaper, I guess would be the only thing that I could do to sell myself, mm -hmm. which I never did. Um, it was just those envelopes going out to all of those people were, that was my, my business card. And so I always tried to go really slowly and write as perfect as I could, because when those people received that envelope, that was my work and that was my name and my business. Okay. And, may I ask you this? Even back then, were you um, doing the one and then doing the um, the uh, digitizing or were you doing each individual one back then? Back then, what I would do is I would get the size of the invitation, what size mm -hmm. it was going to be. Um, and I would write the whole thing in one fell swoop in that size. It was so difficult and I did not enjoy doing it because everything had to be perfectly centered. Everything had to be just as perfect as I could get it. And now this looks so much better than anything that I could have done back then, mm -hmm. but there was no digitizing or at least I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was, and I just didn't know about it yet, but I had to do it the old fashioned way. And I would write it one time, which mm -hmm. took countless tries mm -hmm. to get a copy that I was happy with. Mm -hmm. And then from that point, I would mail the original and they would make copies of it or either make an engraved plate or thermography, right. whatever method they chose. But it was from my handwritten original from beginning to end in the size that it needed to be. Which was so much harder than it is today. Oh Not my, much goodness. harder and didn't look as good. It looks so much better and is so much easier to write. Yeah. Now. yeah. So you did that and your business kept growing. And then I know at some point you all moved to North Alabama. So how did it evolve to where you are today? Yes. So I did sweet Sally Hobson was so nice to give me business. And then, you know, if you did like a big Atlanta wedding, then you were kind of in that market. I got mm -hmm. in the Atlanta market. I got in the Pensacola market there for a while. So word of mouth is how I built my business up until social media came around. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, Instagram was a game changer. And I'll never forget when Reagan, my oldest daughter, I have two daughters, when she was on a field trip one time to Montgomery, um, one of the other moms on the field trip said, well, you need to put your work on Instagram because look at this account that I follow of this calligrapher. And look, she's got you know a lot of followers and she promotes her work that way. And I so vividly can remember saying, <laughs> I will never put my work on Instagram. That is way too terrifying. 
And she was like, but, but you're as good as she is. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, th- this will never happen for me. It's too mm-hmm. invasive. Like mm-hmm. it's scary to put yourself out there. Mm-hmm. And so I, one time I remember I wrote something and I thought, well, this looks really good. I'm really proud of this. Mm-hmm. You know, like all of the flourishes ended up just right. My letters mm-hmm. looked good. I was very proud of what I wrote. And I thought, okay, if there ever is going to be a moment that I'm going to post something about my calligraphy, now's the time. Yeah. So I just jumped off the cliff and posted it. And people are so nice. And they made me feel so good. And they were like, Suzanne, this is beautiful. And, you know, I would respond back. Oh my gosh, thank you. This has made me feel so wonderful because I was scared to death. And so Mm -hmm. just little by little, my, just my personal Instagram account kind of morphed into my calligraphy account. And in hindsight, I should have opened up a separate account just for calligraphy because now, like if you scroll back in the very, very, very beginning, you might find a few personal pictures yeah Uh, yeah. now I never put personal pictures on there because it's just all of my calligraphy stuff but um that was a huge game changer for me and now I the other game changer really that has come about for me personally honestly was COVID and the pandemic and everything shutting down Mm -hmm. um I know it killed some businesses and I I hate that but Fortunately, I've never taught so much as what I'm teaching now. And it was all because everything went remote and everything went online. And so used to, I would travel maybe once or twice a month, just all over the country and teach in person. And the classrooms were, you know, the size of a typical classroom. I would have maybe about 20 or 25 people in a class. And that was it and no more because it was in a classroom and you couldn't hold any more than that. And so my good friend and calligrapher um, friend, Kestrel Montez, she lives in California. She texted me or maybe called me one day. I can't remember now and said, I want us to do a live class together and I'll be your platform host. And so I was like, yes, let's do it. And so she is so tech savvy. Thank goodness. She made me get, or actually she just sent me the same kind of document camera as what she had. So she could say, push this button, push this button. And we would be in sync right together because she knew how stupid I was in that area. And she was so very gracious to me and took her time and taught me how to use Zoom and taught me how to use the document camera and all of those things. And so our first class that we taught together was at the very beginning of the pandemic. Pandemic, And if I'm not mistaken, I think we had about 420 in the class. That is and mind-blowing. It was crazy. It was crazy. And, you know, when you first log on and let everybody in the classroom, people are saying, you know, hello from from Florida, hello from so-and-so. It would be like, hello from Australia, Hong Kong, Ireland, the Netherlands, all over the world. It was insanity. And, you know, I, I told them in the beginning, I said, I am from North Alabama and I have a very strong North Alabama redneck accent. <laughs> and I am so sorry to these people across the, the ocean yeah. that are probably struggling to understand me. But, you know, it is what it is at this point. Yeah. I can't change the way I talk. Um, so I had my document camera, which is this right here. And it just is, you know, hovering over my work. And you can zoom in super close. The good thing about doing the Zoom classes is that everybody has a front row seat. Everybody is right there. My letters are huge, blown up. And or I can zoom out where you can see my hand and exactly how, you know, I make a certain letter. I can zoom it out. I can zoom it in. And the greatest thing about Zoom versus an in-person class is that it's recorded just like this podcast. And you can go back if you can't catch it live, or even if you do catch it live, you can go back and watch the recording. You can pause it whenever you need to and make little notes on your handouts or maybe try to 
do what I just did with your pen and ink. And then you can go back and rewatch that little section. If you don't understand something that I've said, you can go back and rewind it, play that little part again. That is the greatest pro to doing the Zoom classes. It's and so it like, just exploded. It's almost like, or it basically is, you're getting a private. It's just other people are getting a private too. Yes, because absolutely. And you, you said that, um, which I think is wonderful because I would immediately think, oh, are people raising their hand and asking, but you said that happens at the end. You, your class, everyone's yes. muted, but you're teaching like someone is in a college class or a yes. whatever. And yes. then the questions can come at the end. And do people get to dialogue with you that are in your course if they have a question? Yes, yes, they do. So we, I've done it a couple of different ways and both ways are great and it doesn't matter to me. Um, sometimes people will unmute themselves and it depends on my platform host, which I have two. I have one that does all of my classes and then I have another platform host that's in Hong Kong that does beginning calligraphy. And so with the Hong Kong host, people can unmute themselves and ask their question directly right then. Mm -hmm. um, with the other host that's in California, Kestrel, what we do is I teach for two hours and then the last 30 minutes, she, so during that time, you type your question into chat and she is fielding all of these questions. And so the last 30 minutes, she'll say, okay, we've got a handful of questions and she'll ask the questions to me and I'll go over everything, whether it's demonstrating something or re-explaining something. And we do all of those at the very end. Both ways work great, and I'm great with doing it mm -hmm. either way. She just prefers doing all of the questions at the end, so it sort of doesn't mess up my flow of teaching. Yes, uh, and you are teaching for two hours, and and let me tell you, I would think that, that I would need that. I would need to be able to focus on that with no distraction for at least an hour and yeah, I yeah. think two is probably perfect now right everyone's working on the same thing correct yes exactly exactly so take for instance when you go to make a lowercase a in calligraphy mm -hmm. in the copper plate script you know when you go to write an a say if you're writing the word and with a pencil you just write a n d and you just scribble it out and you don't even think about it but when you go to write the word and in calligraphy, calligraphy, it's not just an A, an N, and a D. You learn the separate strokes. And when you put a combination of those strokes together, they form the letters. So take, for instance, the letter oh. A. It's not just an A. You're writing an entry stroke. You're writing an oval. And then you're writing an underturn. So an A takes oh. three strokes. So first of all, we learn all of the basic strokes, which there are about nine of those. Mm -hmm. And then you learn to put those combinations of those different strokes together to form the different letters. And so um, in the beginning, I'll talk about the pen, the different parts of the pen, the way you need to hold your pen, the angle of everything, your setup on your desk, the way you need to sit, the way the paper needs to be turned. And then we get into all of those basic strokes. So we'll learn an entry stroke, an oval, an overturn, an underturn, a double turn, an ascending loop, a descending loop, a full pressure stroke, a reverse double turn. So we learn all of those basic strokes together. They're watching me on the screen and they're doing it themselves. And then once we do that, then we move into the lowercase letters, which are divided up into six groups. And so the first group are the most simple letters like the letter I and the letter U. Those are just really, really easy, simple letters. So we start with the most simple, work our way over to the most intricate, like an S. It doesn't really fall into any group. It's kind of an exception. What about a Z? A Z is going to be in your descending loop. Okay, okay. That loop that hangs down below the body of the letter. So that's mm -hmm. called a descending letter. So you, and you start with the lowercase and you do all the subsets of the, the six right. groupings of that. Yes. And then you go to the. On to the uppercase. And so, so 
that all, all of that, by the time you work your way through, you've written words, you've learned the uppercase alphabet, you've learned the whole shebang. All of that takes four classes. In four the two hour classes. Yes. Yes. And Eight usually hours. what we'll do is we'll do like maybe a Monday and a Thursday or Tuesday and Friday, whatever our schedules look like for two weeks. So you'll have like Monday, Thursday, next week, Monday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. And you can go on uh, for Kestrel, which is where I teach the bulk of my work. She has a website called learncalligraphy.com. And she has lots of different teachers that teach underneath her. And I teach several different classes for her. And, um, and I will link to all of this because I know there are people wanting to write this down right now. All of this will be in the show notes. Exactly how to find Suzanne. Awesome. Um, and her classes and awesome. um, exactly how to link and her, your Instagram. Go ahead and, and we'll share that again, but go ahead and share your Instagram yeah. handle. Yes. So my Instagram, like I said, was just my personal one in the beginning. So yeah. there's, there's nothing that says calligraphy in it. Sadly to say, it's just S U Z Cunningham, which is C U N N I N G H A M. And that was just my very personal one. And then about eight years ago, I took it off of private and made it public. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really how I could grow my audience was by switching to public. Well, Suzanne, after someone has taken eight hours, I know that it's probably like in life, you've got your star students who look like they've been, been doing it for years. And then are there some people who uh, it just doesn't come easily for and they have to work harder? Ab yes, absolutely. Just like in any kind of art that you try to learn, whether it's painting or learning to play an instrument you've mm -hmm. got some of those who are naturally gifted at it but the great thing about calligraphy is that you do not have to have good handwriting to be able to do it great because um, it's really not you're really having to learn something completely apart from yes. those handwriting classes we took in elementary yes. school yes this is not like zaner blows or cursive that you learned in the second grade Right. You are learning separate strokes and you're just connecting those strokes together to form whatever letter you're wanting to write. So you absolutely do not have to have good handwriting because it's not handwriting. It's learning those strokes. It's strokes. That's the, yes. So that's the great thing about it because so many people say, oh, I, I have terrible handwriting. Does not matter. That's not matter. Okay. Now, does everyone get to choose whether they do the, the fine quilt uh, nib or the broad nib? Wait, is it fine yes, broad or medium? Edge, broad edge nib or a pointed nib. Pointed or broad edge. Now, do they have to use whatever you tell them for the lessons? Yes, they because do. Because they're a little different. Yes. Okay. Like you can't do copper plate calligraphy with a broad edge nib. Oh, okay. okay. So that I, mean, I guess you could, but it wouldn't look. Okay. So the, a lot of that just is what it is. Yes. Now, do you dip your nib into the little ink well, or is it yes. self feeding? Yes, you do. So sitting here, I've got my little jar of ink that comes in a bajillion different colors. Um, this one is called walnut ink. It's just a very rich brown color. So I'm not going to take the top off, but all you do is you dip it down in there and I don't know if you can see it or not but the the nib has a little tiny hole in the middle of it mm -hmm. and that's called your reservoir or your eyelet and this little eyelet hole if you dip the the nib down far enough that it covers up this little hole with ink that acts as a reservoir and you can write for a fairly good little while like maybe at least one whole line before you have to redip and you can kind of tell when you're about to run out of ink, you can just tell it doesn't look quite the same as it did, mm -hmm. in, you know, at, after you freshly dipped it. Mm -hmm. So once you can tell that you're just about to run out, you just redip and just keep on going. Do you um, have to have a different nib or pen for every color that you use? No, not at all. Not at all. Oh, okay. Um, the nib, the thing that's different about the nib. So this particular kind of nib is called a Hunt 101, mm -hmm. which if you don't know calligraphy, that doesn't mean anything to you. But the 101 is a very flexible nib. So when I press down and pull back on my paper, 
the nib is divided up into two tines. So there's a left tine and a right tine. And when you press down on the paper, those tines splay open. And the more flexible the tine, the wider your shade is going to be. The stiffer the, the nib, the, the less the tines are gonna spread open. And so you're not gonna get as big of a, a wide of a shade. So if you've got to make larger letters and you really want a, a nice wide shade, you have to use a more flexible nib. If you're writing smaller and you don't need a big humongous wide shade, you need to choose a, a nib that's more stiff. And so the different stiffnesses and flexible proponents of the nib, you choose those based on what you're writing and the size of what you're writing. Yeah. And um, also you just kind of get used to a particular nib and it becomes your favorite. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, that kind of plays a part in it also. Also, if you've got like really rough textured paper, like cold press watercolor paper is very, very rough. Mm -hmm. Handmade paper is uh -huh. sort of rough. You can't use a nib that's super pointed and super flexible because when you go to do an upstroke, it's going to catch on oh, that gosh. surface. Oh, so you have to have something that's a little bit more stiff that's going to glide across the paper when you're doing upstrokes and the point is not going to catch in it because when you catch the point on the paper, then the, the ink sort of sprays out and I mean, it's toast. You've got to just throw it away and start over. Okay. So Suzanne, in your classes, you have, you can have anywhere from 200 to 400 or however many, mm -hmm. what are the demographic, I know they're all different countries. What, what ages and sexes, I mean, what's the makeup of, of a typical class? Yes. Just knowing this, mainly from Instagram, I, I do get a printout from where everyone are, is from. Um, but my biggest audience is 25 to 35 and most are women. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is just my core group audience. And so that is also mostly who takes the lessons online, but not always. I, whenever I would teach um, in person, we would always laugh because there would be one token male in the class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we would always be like, well, y'all be my friend. I'm the only man in the whole class. Oh, that's so cute. Uh, maybe two men if we got lucky, which Honestly, the men are amazing at calligraphy. Um, so great. I know, I know. So I always love it when I do have a man in, in an in-person class because I'm like, yay, I've got a man. Oh, that's right. And, now, can, so when you're doing a remote class, they can see you, of course. Can you see all of them? I cannot see them. Okay. You I just see, see like the name or the, okay. Right, right. And so we all sink in in the very beginning beginning and they they put their pictures up there in their video and I can hear them and for you know like five minutes we chit chat and whatnot but then usually I have so many people in the class that everybody meets themselves and turns off their video mm -hmm. just in case you don't have a great internet connection right you know it won't pull bandwidth from you mm -hmm. and um so the very first time I taught on zoom I was like this is terrible. I don't like this at all because it was, I'm down here in my basement and it's like, I'm sitting down here talking to myself because all of their videos were turned off. I could oh. see my writing on my computer screen. And it was like, I'm just talking to no one. Oh, and that's so, now see that would come so naturally for me, but for you, you're yeah, so yeah. poised well, and proper and well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, no, I, I'm used to it now, but I was right. used to teaching in person where I was no, feed, where you got feedback. And you got feedback. feedback. There's oh. never like a oh or oh okay I see or a like, head nod or nothing. Oh, nothing. Yes. that is very. But nothing has it become all. a lot easier now? Have you? It's, to it's totally easy now. I'm totally used to it. But I'll never forget. I walked upstairs and I told my husband. I said that was for the birds. I <laughs> did not like that at all. And so he was like, "Okay, well, let's think of some pros and cons to." 
in-person classes and Zoom classes. He said, you don't have to take a day to travel. You don't have to take a day to come home. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pack all of your supplies up and hope that you didn't forget something. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like- And that applies to the students too. Yes. yes. And see, to me, yes. that is the beauty of what you were doing. And that's why I was so excited. And I wanted to put this out there because I mean, literally, if I didn't have all the stuff that I can't even keep up with right now, I would be signing up for your class so so quickly, you, my your head would spin. It, yeah, because yeah. I've always wanted to do this. But there are just like my friend, her niece who's a stay at home mom. Mm -hmm. She said, "Oh my goodness, she would not only love this, but that could potentially be a way for her to yes. stay at home. Yes, and absolutely. have a little something to to take." creative time and use those creative juices but it That's could turn right. into something That's how many people that you've had as students do you see them go on to really do a lot with this I um, know you probably don't get to keep up with everyone like you, I, you know. I don't keep up with everybody but a lot of people will post on Instagram and tag me or either send me a DM and say, oh my gosh, I just got my first uh, client. Or, you know, somebody has recommended me and I get to do, you know, the place cards for so-and-so. And they're so excited. And that absolutely puts the biggest smile on my face. Oh, because it's just like everything comes full circle. And uh, it, it, it's just the best feeling. It's absolutely the best feeling. You're doing what you love, that you found your purpose and helping other people find yes. their purpose or, or just fulfill their days with something productive. I mean, I just think it's wonderful. And Suzanne, let me ask you this. If you take the eight courses um, and you say, hey, I want to, can you get even more advanced or is it basically honing the skill? Yes. I mean, you yes. see what I'm saying? Because some things right. you just have to get better at what it is right. some you can do more right right so if you're a total beginner and you take the beginning course I always tell everyone this is just like learning how to play the piano after one lesson you can't play like your teacher after 25 lessons you can't play like your teacher mm -hmm. after a year's worth of practicing you cannot play like your teacher so don't think that you're going to take this course and, and then start opening up a business and whip out all of you know, this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so you have, but you do need to practice a little bit every day or set aside three days a week, 30 minutes, um, work on one particular thing and slowly over time, it will come. If your brain knows what those letters are supposed to look like, your hand will eventually catch up with practice, just like it will the piano. Oh. You eventually can play like your teacher if you put enough time and effort in. Because so after you learn everything, it is up to you. It's totally up to you. Like I could write your name just as easily as I could write my name in calligraphy, but you couldn't. Because right. you don't have that muscle memory yet. And I do. That's the only difference. I've got wow. the muscle memory. So it's just all about doing it 5,000 times over and over until you can write it without having to think about it. Well, I do have to ask you, um, if, and I'm sure other people are thinking this. I had to do, um, well, even signing checks. You still have to sign checks every now and then. I had to do a DocuSign for some things that Zane and I were doing with uh -huh. our finances. I looked at his because he had already done them and I looked at mine. It looked like a chicken had walked over. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is even, I don't even know who's going to read this. I mean, DocuSign right. accepted it, but I'm like, this is Docu really signing is shameful. Hard. It's yes, shameful. Yes. And I would love to have to sign something and someone say, oh my goodness, that's beautiful. I yes, bet even yes. when you sign a check, people are like, Oh my goodness. I mean, do you just well, get it all the time? No, not necessarily, but I do, I, I do get that occasionally. But the funniest thing is that a few years ago, I had to go get my driver's license renewed. Mm -hmm. And so I was so excited because I was having a great hair day that day. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, my hair for once, it, it did what I wanted it to do. Yeah, so I'm so yeah. happy. And so I stood there, I made the picture, I signed the little machine, um, paid my 
money. And I, and so she handed me my little paper copy. And so I walked out to the car and I sat down in the car to look at the picture to see how my hair looked. Of course, that's what we all do. <laughs> my hair that day. <laughs> and what I didn't realize is when I signed on the computer, that was my signature on my driver's license. And I didn't even try to make letters. I just went, just, <sighs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Because I was just signing it to pay my bill. Oh, yeah. And I was like, you. <laughs> and now crazy. you show that to everyone. And I am a calligrapher, <laughs> and you can't even read. It's not even letters. You can't even read it. That's <laughs> so <laughs> funny because actually, Zane and I both sort of do that. I think as you get older, you just sort of do something. You know, they're going to take anything. It's just, you know. Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, okay, like, well, okay. I need to do better. Okay. Well, Suzanne, because I want to just round this out with you giving anyone who's maybe thinking, oh, I may want to do that. What are some other things that you can do with that, that if you don't ever want to try to do a business or whatever, what are some, I mean, I can already think of things like ornaments and beautiful, like write a poem and frame it or what, I mean, what are, what are some things you've seen? Or like, I mean, there are just so many beautiful things. The, the opportunities, honestly, are endless. I make so many Christmas presents every year, mm -hmm. um, I, wh whether it's just like a Bible verse or a poem or a bookmark. I make tons of bookmarks oh, yeah. for yeah. like my small group Bible study for Mother's Day. And you can punch a hole in the end and put a, a pretty ribbon on the end of it. Um, and, you know, write a Bible verse or, or whatever, the, or their name, whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. Birth announcements. Um, I, I mean, yes. I do tons of birth announcements. I, I do tons of baby gifts that is a cross um, for baby gifts. And I put the child's name on the crossbar going horizontally and then going this way. I put a Bible verse and I put their weight, the length and the time that they were born. And oh. that is such a great gift that you can do that's not ever replicated. The only drawback to that is that you do have to wait till the child is born to know that information. Yeah. But anytime I'm at like a baby shower, I just make a little card that says, I owe you one baby cross or something like that. And oh. they usually know what it is. Now, if someone wants to get on that, on that note, if someone wants to get a cross from you, do you do that and mail them? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh. So oh, all of this is on your, um, what is the best way to get all, I, I mean, it's all going to be in the show notes. So go to your Instagram, okay. but yeah, what's yeah. the, where are, like, if someone wants to order something as for right. a gift, where just, do they go? Uh, just send me an email, uh, okay. and we can talk further about what exactly it is that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Uh, my email is S U Z as in zebra eight, two, two Cunningham at gmail.com. And you can also send me a DM in Instagram if you want to, but I, I tend to see the emails more than I see the DM. Sometimes yeah. the DMs kind of get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Um, so I, I do, I do answer them and see them sometimes, but not all the time. I would prefer an email. I, I totally get that. And um, as far as if someone's getting ready to plan a wedding and they want, they can check with you. And if you, um, yes, the, the, you've also got other people. You have a network. You are a network of, yes. of the Absolutely. whole. Absolutely. If someone wanted me to write the invitation or to address the envelopes, I, I can do as little or as much as you need me to do. Um, if I'm booked, I've got a whole host of people that I can refer you to. Because uh, this is probably your busy, busy, or probably a few months ago where you're busy, busy. Yes. busy right after the new year is when my busy season hits because people get engaged yeah. at, at yeah. Christmas. And then sometimes those, those spring and summer weddings, you know, you have to start the envelope process and the invitation process months ahead. So, and now with save the date, that's another, uh, an added thing that we did not do when we were. Yes. I know. I know. Wow. Back when I got married, I was like, what is the save the date? And now everybody yeah. or most people send them. Suzanne, I think this is so fabulous. I, I mean, I just love this. And I am so hopeful that people out there who are interested will take the, the plunge and do this because it sounds so fun and so Thank rewarding you. and Thank could you not have a sweeter you. or more 
knowledgeable teacher and oh my goodness you, know, you are so precious to have me on and it's just so good to reconnect with you again well you it's as well so special well and i look forward to seeing you at um, more parties and the wedding yes, and, and all and, um, these weddings coming up yeah. oh, one thing that i did want to say um i, I did have the learn calligraphy.com website that is my california host Oh, okay. I wanted to add one other host, which is the one in Hong Kong. I can't even think of their website off the top of my head, but on Instagram, they're they're called the Gentle Penman. The Gentle G E N T L E Penman P E N M A N. And yes, and that's, that's and the they're thing. they're the ones. They're the hosts that always are my platform host for beginning calligraphy. So if you don't know calligraphy at all, and I know I'm gonna teach that course next March uh, for them, all the other classes that I teach are through learncalligraphy.com. And it's okay. like how to address envelopes, how to create your own monogram, how to do flourishing. Um, I have a, an advanced copper plate course, how to, um, there's one class called conquering layouts where we lay out large pieces. So there's just a uh, modern calligraphy, imperial script. But I none of those, they all have to take the beginning or they wouldn't be able to do the other, correct? They don't, they need to at least know how to operate a pointed pen. Okay. They don't necessarily have to be great at it. They'll still okay. get a lot of great stuff out of the course. Okay, but so to be yeah. optimal, it, they'd just come into it with a lot more if they would take the beginner. Class. Right, right. Okay. And the beginning course is through the Gentle Penman. And then all of the other courses are through learncalligraphy.com. Okay. Well, I yeah. will have every bit of this on the um, podcast page of the show notes. And Suzanne, thank you, my friend. I'm so thank glad that we got to have this podcast. I think it's going to be a blessing to many. Me too. Thank you so much, Jamie. And I just love you to death and am so happy to reconnect with you. It's just been wonderful. Well, it has, and you have a fabulous rest of your day. I will, you too, and I'll talk to you soon.